Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity. Lord, to simply gather in your name. Lord, I thank you for this beautiful venue that we get to gather in this morning. I thank you for the venue that's here on campus for, for the men and women to gather to learn your word, to sing your praises, to fellowship together, Lord, to talk to you in prayer. This morning, Lord, to worship you through communion. Lord, thank you for this space in which to do these most holy things. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing with the, um, the ministry to our children. Lord, I, I just ask that you would continue to do a great work in that endeavor. To see kids come to new life in Jesus and learn what it's like to, to live in a love relationship with you, how to connect together as a community, and how to go and live on mission. Lord, be with our children. Be with our students this morning, Lord, as they gather to do the same. And Lord, I, I just pray for those gathered on site and online this morning that you would work your will in your way. Lord, I, I just ask in all humility that you would um, quiet the voice of distraction, depression. Quiet the voice of the enemy. The fullness and busyness that can come in the 21st century of just being an American. And Lord, in these moments that we're gathered, may we have, as you say in this text, ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And Lord, last thing I would just ask this morning is, Lord, would you just give me the ability to serve you and your people well? I pray that this time would not be lost on them, but Lord, they would press into what you would have to say through your word. And God, that you, by your grace, would be seen clearly. And Holy Spirit, that you would minister your word appropriately and effectively. And I pray that in the only name that I can recognize that really matters, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I pray. Amen. 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 Jesus loves church. One of the reasons I love the book of Revelation is that it comes with a divine outline. Revelation, you could say, is organized into three sections. The things that are, the things that are for the churches, and then the things that are to come. Chapter 1 is that first section. Chapters 2 and 3 is the second section where we find ourselves today. We're going to be considering the, the fifth church of these seven churches that Jesus actually had words for. And it's interesting to me, you know, there's some things that we should know about these churches. They were real. I like that. That the Bible is not just good views about life and eternity, but it's an historical, accurate document of that which actually happened in reality. That there were real churches. Today, the area is known as modern-day Turkey. The second thing we should recognize is that these letters, and if I can have your attention on this piece, it's why the series is entitled Jesus Loves Church. These letters give clarity to what it means to be loved by Jesus. Today's message is interesting. Because there's nothing that Jesus points out in the church that we'll consider today that he's stoked about. Nothing that he would say, oh, you're doing this well. It's one of the only churches that we'll find that there's no commendation given. Interesting. I think these letters give clarity into what it means to be loved by Jesus, that his love is tender and at times tough. That his love is thorough and timely. And that his love does have a peace that is exhortive or encouraging, but also warning. 
these letters that we're reading through each Sunday for the last few Sundays and a few more are both universal and personal, meaning they apply to everyone. And then again, if I can have your attention, they apply to you today. Because I really do believe there is a God who is sovereign, that knows the number of your days. I mean, some of the most formative things in your life, when, to whom, and where you were born, you had no control over. None whatsoever. No volitional engagement with that at all. But God did. So why do you say that? I believe God is the one who knit you together before you were born. And he's working together a tapestry of time that is called your life. And you can make choices and decisions. You can choose to engage in certain endeavors or to not. Choose to make friends with certain people or to not. And within all of that, of your choice, your responsibility, God is still sovereign. So why do I say that? Because I believe God has something for you and for me from the church of Sardis on April 3rd at 9.44 a.m. I believe he's alive. I believe that this book actually does this. It talks to you. Like it's living and active. Does that make sense? But only if you're willing to listen. Only to the initiated. Only to those who will have eyes to see and ears to hear. These letters are universal and personal, but they also follow a similar pattern. You know this about me if we've had any opportunity to spend any time together, be it one-on-one or in this kind of setting, I'm an addicted alliterator. Does that, you know what that means? I'll tell you what that means. I'll show you. I'll give you an example. There are seven C's that I see that Jesus and the way that he communicates to these churches. Here they are. Number one, he identifies the church. You see that pattern every single time. You know who he's talking to. Then there's a characterization of Jesus, something that he shares. And this is what I find so interesting. He does it so beautifully in this chapter today. Jesus knew how to take the atmosphere of the room the situation surrounding the people, the circumstances, the climate, and he would use those elements to connect to his audience in a way that was masterfully done. And he gives this characterization to each church, and it's specific to that church because it relates to them. It resonates with them. Like right now, that crying baby, I heard that. You know how I heard that? Because I have that all the time in my world. I'm like sensitive. Oh, is his baby okay? What does he need? Like stomach? You're just eating food? You're learning how to digest? Like... I'm sensitive to that. There's the church, there's the characterization, there's the commendation, some sort of encouragement by Jesus. There's critique by Jesus. There's a command given, often counsel and caution and comfort at the end. Now, as you walk through these churches, you may see that that order doesn't always follow that sequential pattern. And sometimes there is no commendation or there is no warning, but in general, they follow this pattern. And so this morning, we'll consider the fifth church that Jesus wrote a letter to, the church in Sardis. And here's the challenge of Sardis. They were very good at Instagram. What does that mean? They had a phenomenal reputation. Like, was like, oh, have you heard of what God is doing in church? It's amazing. They had reputation, but really nothing going for them. And as I read through this chapter, this text, I'm reminded of a lesson that I I believe we've heard many times, but it seems like it's tested every time, and it's simply this. We must learn to hold our reputation lightly. But our integrity and our authenticity tightly. We don't let that go. Because the facade fades. But authenticity accrues good interest. Does that make sense? I heard this recently about integrity. That if you have it, things just get better. 
And if you don't, you eventually have to leave. And that can be in any context, but it's true. Here's what I need to share before we look at this text this morning. This message is hard to give. Because in these six verses, Jesus doesn't have anything to say that's like, you guys are you're doing it. It's more of a warning. Anyone ever like um, had, a, had a kid or seen a kid or been a kid? Does that relate to anybody in here? <laughs> you know about kids? Sometimes you have to give warnings. Does that make sense? We have a new family member named Ollie who's four months old. He's not human. He's canine. Different experience for us. Used to four-month-old, but of the human kind. And the boys, my, I'd have two human boys named Leo and Liam. They're learning that there's certain things that they can and can't do with Ollie, or else he responds. And there's warning. Hey, if you do this, you'll have a little, like, half circle here with, like, little dots that's called teeth mark. <laughs> Like, don't mess with him like that. Don't step on that tail. He is not a trampoline. Don't jump on his stomach, you know. Don't do that. It's okay to have a warning. Because I don't want them to experience the consequence of the action. And that's what Jesus does today. Where does the warning come from? From love. <laughs> Sometimes It's okay to be warned. To be told, don't do that. That's not a lack of love. That's one of the most loving things you could do is to warn someone that, hey, if you continue down this path, there's death for you. That's what Jesus does today. Let's look at verses one through six of Revelation chapter three. And then all we're gonna do this morning is kind of walk through those seven C's. Verses one through six. Jesus says this. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all the things you do, that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead, and I find your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed first, hold to it firmly, repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly, as unexpected as a thief. Yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white, and I will never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my Father and angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. The church at Sardis. Sardis was an important, wealthy, crossroads capital city. A city of trade and center for military. It was known for its production of woolen garments. Remember that as we walk through what Jesus has to say to this church was located at the junction of five main roads about 50 miles east of Ephesus, built on a high bluff with the city center sitting nearly 1,500 feet above the main roads. What does that mean? It means they had zip code envy. Do you know what that is? It's like, where do you live? And they're like, oh, I live here. like, oh, wow, that's where you live, on the bluffs looking down upon all of us peons coming to your city. Interestingly, Sardis had a graveyard called the Cemetery of 1,000 Hills that they were very proud of. One author wrote, from seven miles away, you could see not only the temple of worship that they had to Diana, or better known as Artemis, atop the Acropolis, but also this cemetery filled with hundreds and hundreds of burial mounds and tombstones. Interesting piece of information. Well, 
the characterization. How does Jesus connect with this church? Look what he says in verse 1. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. Why this description? Jesus is affirming, I am the one who has position and power in this church. That's what Jesus is saying about himself. One author says this, that the church of Sardis lacked the one thing it needed the most, the Holy Spirit. This author goes on to say, Jesus introduced himself as the one who has the seven spirits of God. And he says that he's using a phrase from Isaiah chapter 11, which kind of denotes the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And I love what this author said. It's the reason I wanted to read it. He says, a dead church needs the infusion of the sevenfold spirit of God, just as a spiritually dead individual does. The church at Sardis had become so much like the world around it that it could no longer confront its society. And that's what spiritually dead means. It would mean this. With small cities, regions, counties, states that are filled with big churches, why do they have such little impact? on their governance, on their community, on their region. Why is that? Why, if there's this place that has this reputation for alive, not in the community, doesn't seem like it's getting out of those doors or off that online stream. It's not going anywhere. It's not impacting the area. It's dead. And this is what he says, and I want to read this from Warren Wiersbe. Love W.W., such a great author. He says, all of the church's man-made programs can never bring life. I love VBS. I think it's awesome. I think you should sign your kids up for it. But that won't bring life to your kids. Say, what? No, 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 the Holy Spirit working through individuals and the gospel preached, that's what does it. But, But VBS is like the program that helps us get in. Does that make sense? Like, it's just the portal. But it's God's spirit moving. It's his word. It's the gospel that brings new life. Warren goes on to say, the church was born when the spirit of God descended on the day of Pentecost and its life comes from the spirit, from the spirit. When the spirit is grieved, the church begins to lose life and power. When sin is confessed and church members get right with God and with each other, the spirit infuses new life. I love how simple that is. Just like live vertical and live horizontal. Like live in right relationship with God by the power of his spirit. Be kind to one another. Forgive one another. Believe rightly. That's how the spirit can move most powerfully. This is so interesting. It's not location, activity, wealth, or connection that brings life. It's the spirit of God. Now, is there anything wrong with the church having a good location? No, I think it's a good good idea. Is there anything wrong with having good programs? No, I think programs are very helpful. Programs like bring clarity. Oh, that's how my kids can get engaged. Oh, that's how this. Those are awesome. We should have those. But where does the life come from? From the Spirit of God. And I do believe that's why Jesus says here, the one who has it. See, the church will always, always belong to Jesus. It's his church. I, as a pastor, don't have the right, I firmly believe this, to say, well, here's my vision for your church, Jesus. That's kind of like, what? (laughs) No, no, I just need you to serve it. Like, (laughs) that's what the pastor needs to do. Like, what does this say, and how do we see it done? That's what I think we're here to do as Is anyone in the church, no matter what role it is, it belongs to him. So if it belongs to him, let's find out what he wants. And I don't think it's going to be like, well, let's just go on the beach and Moana this thing. (laughs) Do you know what I'm saying? Like, just look at the water. God will speak. I mean, I think it's good to get like a little bit of peace and quiet and like, you know, just hear from the Lord in the sense of having a quiet heart. But this is where I hear from God. 
Someone once told me this, Anil, don't be afraid to think out of the box, but never outside of the book. Like, be creative, be, be led by the Spirit of God, but the Word of God always corrects or confirms that which you think is the Spirit of God moving. So here's what you should do. Get to know this book, and then worry about being creative or cool. But here's what I've found. The more you get to know this book, you're like, ah, being creative and cool, it's not that big a deal. Like, <laughs> this is what matters. This is what matters. And yet I believe that it's a challenge in this culture that we're in to, to try and think, well, how do we be, how do we be, and then maybe the bot, no, <laughs> what does this say? And let's just do that. Let's do that. The commendation, we've considered the characterization, the church, none is really given. He says, I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but here's the critique. You are dead there, there's the show but no substance there's the reputation but no reality there's the veneer but no vitality there, there's like that force oh the church is a force in this area well no it's more just a form and here's what i find so interesting and amazing about jesus he considers the context of the area a city that's preoccupied with death, with a cemetery of 1,000 hills. And Jesus says, you're just like where you're from. You're dead. And that would have been like, bing, 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 bing. I know what you're talking about. See, Jesus is truly the master at connecting with those he was speaking with. And I'll just be honest in church, if that's okay. Like, like as a church kid, I always heard that. And I always like, I don't know. I've heard good communicators, like... Jesus seems like okay, but I mean, the right thing to say is Jesus is the best because he's the guy that rose from the dead. And then the more I study the Bible, I learn about the culture, the language, the history and go, wow, Jesus had this way of connecting with people where you didn't even realize all that he was doing because it was so simple. Because he could use any and everything around him to connect with the person and he would often speak in rhyme and meter so that you could remember it. And like, that guy's amazing. Amazing what Jesus could do. He could take the situation or circumstance or familiarity or culture or dynamic of what the people were familiar with and relate it to a spiritual truth. But here's what I want to share with you that I find so interesting about what Jesus does in this. He does not participate in cancel culture. Do you know what that is? Have you ever heard of that? Once or twice, maybe? He could have canceled these believers. Hey, you're dead. I'm done with you. He doesn't do that. I don't know of any how cancel culture relates to Christian behavior and community. Oh, you've got a little problem? You're done. What? <laughs> God's like, oh, you've got a little problem? Let me give you my son. That's what he does. That's what he does. And this is what I find so interesting about this passage. He gives a command in verse 2. Look at what he says. He says seven things here that I'm hoping that you'll grasp this morning. Verse 7, he says, wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead, and I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Verse 3, go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent. Turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. There are seven keys, and I want to use this word intentionally, to revival that is authentic and lasting found in this passage. A revival isn't this thing you have to go hunt for. Where is God doing it? Oh, there it is. Let's go. No. It's something that is... A work of God in partnership with the work of his church. He gives seven keys to revival very simply here. First one, wake up. Wake up. Move from woke to awake. That's what we need. Move from that. 
from woke culture to being awakened, to being brought to new life, to see life with spiritual eyes, to see it through this lens so that you can have a correct perspective of what matters most. See, life is truly a race that is to be run. It's a race that's to be run. Life is a job description to complete. Life is a fight to win. That's what the Bible would say. That it's not just your opportunity to kind of make the most of any experience you can and live well. There's a job description for you, and you're to complete it. There's a race that you're to run, and you're to win. There's a fight that's to be fought, and you're to be the victor. Who who is it against? The person next to you. You need to outdo them, compete with them, compare yourself to them, get sad when they do a little bit better than you. No. The world, the flesh, and the devil are your enemies. And if you're going to compete with anyone, this is what you do. God, very simply, I just want to be who you've called me to be. If there's sin, Lord, you fight on my behalf on that. If there's a lack of grace with others, change me from the inside out. It's a battle against the flesh that's won by his spirit. And then you fulfill what God has for you. Do you see life with spiritual eyes? How do I get there? The word of God moves someone from woke to awake. The word of God is our filter. The word of God is the pathway to waking up. Number two, strengthen what's struggling. The Greek word here used means to stabilize that which is frail. The embers are there. They need to be fanned into flame. You don't need something new. You need to strengthen that which is already there. How do you do that? Well, this is the third thing I would say, and this is kind of put in the NIV, like Neil's interesting version, but this is what I would say. Finish what you start. Really, where do you get that? You see that there in um, verse 2 where he says, I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. The indication of this language is not about reputation, but relationship. One Bible commentator said this, they perform duties of all kinds, but not duty completely. They were constantly beginning, but never brought anything to proper end. Just follow through. That's what he's saying. Like, listen, wake up. Like strengthen what's struggling and just keep moving forward. Just keep moving forward. And then he says, this is point number four, go back to the basics. Like it says in verse three, go back to what you heard and believed at first. See, he's saying, look at your heritage, the things that once made you great. Be reminded of those things. And one author says this about that. Use those things as a guidepost, not a hitching post. But remember the faithfulness of your God. Remember what he's done and allow his past faithfulness to form your confidence and faith for an uncertain future. That's what looking back should do. Looking back shouldn't cause us to go back in the sense like, well, let's just the good old days. No, no, no. We don't worship our past, but we appreciate the journey that has brought us to a present appreciation for God. His word is true. Let's remember that. His grace is sufficient and Jesus is enough. Don't move away from those things. And then what does he say to do? Hold fast is what he says. Hold fast. The New Living Translation says to hold these basics firmly. That means to be diligent, to cling to, to take firm grasp of. Warren Wearsby says this, the impression is that the assembly in Sardis was not aggressive in its witness to the city. There was no persecution because there was no invasion of the enemy's territory. No friction means no motion. The unsaved in Sardis saw the church as a respectable group of people who were neither dangerous nor desirable. 
They were just decent people with a dying witness and a decaying ministry. One of my Bible professors told me this, Neil, if there's no opposition from the enemy, it's because you're going in the same direction as the enemy. Because there's no friction means there's no motion. You're not saying anything. You're not believing anything. You're not doing anything. So like Wearsby says here, the sardines, let's call them that, the people in Sardis. They saw the church as a respectable group of people that were neither dangerous nor desirable. They were just decent people with a dying witness and a decaying ministry. I got to be honest. I don't have time for that. Why do it if that's what we're doing? Just maintaining a form without substance? That's boring. Let's just go make money if we're, if we're going to do that. No. The church that God has given, the spirit that he's given, it has impact by definition of who he is. But the church in Sardis was dead, had this reputation for being alive, but was making no impact. So number six, he says this, you need to repent. Now, what does that word mean? It simply means to change your thinking or Strong's definition would say it this way, to think differently or afterwards. And then point number seven, turn to me again. I, was, I have a handful of pastors I try to pray with every Sunday morning that are all around the southeast and up and down the eastern seaboard. They're all just praying for you. They'll send me one. I'll send them one. And one of them said, praying for revival. I said, man, me too. Me too. But I don't just think that that's a commodity that God just dumps. I think if I read the Bible, there's this beautiful participation of God's spirit with God's people as they be God's people. And I really do believe Revelation chapter 3, he outlines right here, this is how you revive that which is dead. Wake up. Strengthen that which remains. Turn to Jesus. Go back to the basics. Hold fast. Finish what you start. What is he saying? P pull yourself up by your spiritual bootstraps? No. No, no, no. See, here's the deal. The more you like Jesus, just spend time liking him, loving him, knowing him. The more you like Jesus, the more you become like Jesus. But if you flip-flop those, well, I'm going to become like Jesus, and hopefully that'll make me like him. It won't. It'll make you not like the guy. That, that's religious form without substance. See, here's how I would say you do that. I think it's the four pillars that I see in Scripture of a healthy life and a healthy church. It's about new life in Jesus. It's not about behavioral modification. It's about having a whole new life that God gives you. And then you have a love relationship with God because of the gospel. You live for his glory and you grow as a Christian. This is a personal thing. Because of the gospel... My heart is changed, and I begin to live for his glory, for the good of others, and I'm growing as he's leading me. This is what it means to be alive. But you're not designed to do it alone. So as a community, gather to love and worship Jesus. Group to connect and build koinonia fellowship, and then go to make disciples. Gospel, glory, growth. Gather, group, go, and recognize that very soon you and I will be gone. Those seven G's lead to the good life, the life you're designed to live. The gospel is not just a good view. Oh, that's your opinion. The gospel is good news based in historical, accurate truth that there was a man named Jesus who claimed to be God, who raised from the dead, 
by God's Spirit and empowered His church to go and make disciples. That's true. That's real. And as you look around the room, you see lives that have been changed by that beautiful message. And if you want those embers to grow, live for his glory and the good of others. My filtration is simply this. God, today, I exist for him and for them. That's what I'm here to do. Him and them. That's the way you get to the win. Him and them. Gospel and glory. God's glory. The good of others. Growth. But with the community, I gather to love and worship Jesus. I group together to build community and authenticity and accountability and relationship. And I go to make that money and get that next vacation. No. I go to make disciples. He gives counsel. He says in verse 3, if you do not wake up, I will come to you suddenly. I think I can say this verse to like my older children. If you do not wake up, no. Every morning, sometimes it seems like that's getting harder and harder. As an unexpected thief. Now, what does this mean? I want to be 110% transparent. I don't fully know what Jesus means with this. I, I don't want to remove the teeth of scripture. Does that make sense? Like where he's like, hey, he's got a warning here. He's saying he's going to come suddenly. It's not for judgment unto damnation. We know that from the totality of Scripture. We know from Revelation 1 and 2 that what Jesus says in his counsel, that if you don't respond, he'll remove the lampstand, meaning that like, oh, you won't have influence anymore. Like life will just be lived on loop now. It'll just be routine and rut. You're meant to live life alive and on a journey. But but if you don't respond to God, this is what he says. I will come suddenly as an unexpected thief. But here's what I do know. It doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound like the lyric to a pop worship song. Jesus is going to come suddenly as an unexpected thief. Like, oh my gosh, like, (laughs) what are we doing? (laughs) That doesn't sound like I never heard anyone sing that. But this is what one author writes, and I like what he says. He says, history shows on two separate occasions when the enemies arrived and had surrounded Sardis that her careless guards fell asleep. And each time the opposing army slipped in and captured the embarrassed city. Jesus seems to be using this example to teach this church a great truth. If we do not return to worshiping, believing, and living the way we once did, we will not recognize the prophetic signs of his soon coming. You're going to miss it. Like what God wants to do. It's the best way I know how to put it. Is God going to like destroy me? No. But here's what's going to happen. You're going to put yourself on the bench. Do you know what the pine pony is? Did you ever play sports? Like, what does that mean? Bro, you're not in the field. There's no impact. You're, there, you're on the team. You're still getting the ring. But it's not that fun for you. You're just kind of watching. If I may see your eyes, if I can have your attention... You are not dead. You are still alive. You're still here. You still have life in your lungs. There is purpose for you. Pastor Joe and I had this opportunity to pray for this mom who went to be home with Jesus just in the last couple of days. And there was a news article written about her because she had twin boys who were graduating this semester. And she, was, she wanted to do everything possible to make it to their graduation alive. And that wasn't going to happen. So the school and the hospital made it happen to where they were able to do a graduation ceremony there at the hospital just over the last couple of days. And I remember meeting with her, praying with her. She asked if I could come to Fort Walton and just to pray with her. Evidently, she was connected to Coastline for a season. And her mother, mother-in-law just reached out to Joe and I and said, hey, could Neil come over and pray? And I said, well, man, I'd, I'd love to. So I came over and, uh, to Fort Walton Beach and prayed with her. And scripture lined the walls of her room. Glorious purpose still kept her heart beating. Knowing soon that she would be called home. Why do I share this with you? Because you still have life. I know, because I'm looking at you. Most of you are not asleep. Some of you are, but that's okay. 
Maybe you had a long night last night. I know what that's like. There's grace there. But you're alive. Like, like learn the lesson of the famous theologian William Wallace. Every man dies. Not everyone really lives. Don't, that let, don't let that be said of you. Live. Live for God's glory and the good of others and keep growing with them. And then as a community, gather, group, and go. The Life Application Bible Commentary says this, only a change of heart could save them from punishment. That would mean taking God's word seriously and purposefully obeying it. If they refused to wake up and see what was happening to them, Christ would come like a thief unexpectedly as the soldiers who had climbed the walls to capture the city, the soldiers brought destruction. Christ would bring punishment, giving them what they deserved. What all does that mean? I don't really want to find out. I'd rather just be alive and follow Jesus. But here's what I do know. If you would say, man, I'll be honest, like church is a chore. I would rather just live for myself. But I hear what you're saying. Perhaps I'm one that's dead. This is what you need to know. You are not canceled by Jesus. But you are cautioned to wake up. To wake up. To remember what God has done. So to do those first works and just to live for his glory and for the good of others. Finally, we see the comfort that Jesus gives in verses 4 through 6. He says, Yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they're worthy. And all who are victorious will be clothed in white. Once again, I love how Jesus uses what they're familiar with, garments. Remember, this area was known for their wool. He says, For those that are walking with me, their clothes are clean. And the description of the relationship is beautiful. They're walking with Jesus. I like that. They're not sprinting with Jesus. Like, oh, I got to keep up with Jesus. <laughs> got to save the world. No, Jesus saves the world. Let him do that. You just do what you're called to do. You don't have to save anybody. You just do what God's called you to do. You're walking with Jesus. You're walking with him. Relationship and intimacy. Walking with him. You know, with the kids that we have in our home, Often we'll go on a walk or something, and it's just, I don't know, maybe you've been a parent or had a kid or something, and I don't know if this happens to you, but like when they're around me, some, sometimes they just kind of start to crowd me. Like, and we'll start walking, and they kind of somehow get like right in front of me. I'm like, hey, we, we can't really walk together. You keep kind of getting in front of me, or you're behind me, and this isn't that much fun. Just, just stay right here, right next to me. And I think that's what God wants for all of us. We had a pastor here for a season named Bob Rockwell. And I love what he often used to pray. Lord, don't allow us to get ahead of you or to lag behind you, but to stay in step with you. And I remember Bob did um, my wife and I's premarital counseling. And that was a phrase he often shared. And as I've walked with CC and the Lord in ministry, we've been married now 15 years in May, which is next month. I got to think about that. Um, <laughs> next month. Thank you for church. You reminded me. I've seen that that's very true. Jesus, I just want to walk with you. Because sometimes life is confusing. Anyone ever had that happen to you? And you guys are awesome. You know everything about life. Sometimes it's confusing to me. I don't know what you're doing in this situation, Lord, or this relationship. And then you just walk with Jesus, and then hindsight goes, oh, that's what you were doing. I guess I should have just trusted you. Because I don't, I don't see the end from the beginning. I live like a drone because I forget that you're in the drone. You know, I forget that you see the end from the beginning. He says, they're walking with me. And in verses 5 and 6, he says, I'll never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my Father and his angels that they are mine. And anyone with ears to hear must listen to what the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. I really appreciate Warren Wearsby. I hope you're getting that commentary in, in your small groups, just walking through it with this. But his, his Bible commentary is so helpful. He says this, the statement about the names being blotted out 
would also be significant to people in the Roman Empire where citizenship was vitally important. Again, Jesus is connecting with his original audience. It would appear that God's book of life contains the name of all the living. And as unbelievers die, their names are removed from the book. Thus, at final judgment, the book contains only names of the believers. I love how that's put so simply and accurately. Some have often used this text to say, see, you can lose your salvation, get right or get left. I don't know about that. I know that Jesus knows those who are his. And I'm going to trust Jesus to know that. Like we can see fruit, we can make best guesses, but Jesus knows those who are his. Let him worry about the wheat and the tares. Let's not go through and try and figure that out. Just let Jesus do that. But simply put, walking with Jesus does bring like a humble confidence. And Jesus closes this letter as he often does with the letters to the churches, if you have ears to hear. Man, isn't that the challenge? Because there's so much noise out there. Do you have ears to hear? Are you open to what God is saying? See, Jesus loves the church. And the sardines, they weren't canceled. They were cautioned. And his love is revealed. He tells the church to wake up, strengthen what's struggling, finish what you start, go back to the basics, hold fast, repent and rethink, and turn toward Jesus in everything. See, Jesus gives warning to the pretenders and a welcomed promise to those who are walking with him. You see, for us, now is the time and always is the time to get real with God. See, in just a moment, and I'm going to go ahead and invite the worship team forward to help us prepare our hearts for this, but in just a moment, we're going to have the opportunity to observe a sacrament that the church has been observing for hundreds and thousands of years. It's known as communion. Communion. If you have one of these communion packets, I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and, and kind of get it out. And the way this happens is we remove two different filaments. So I'd encourage you to keep the juice up towards Jesus and the bread down. Um, and then this other filament you just open. But here's what I would say. Don't live your life for reputation. Live for integrity, character, and authenticity before God. See, this church of Sardis appeared to have it together. And Jesus, though, he sees everything. He sees everything. Like, this is what's so funny about hiding. It's like, man, it's kind of a waste of time. Jesus sees it all. And he's the one who gives me the, whether or not I pass the test, why do I care what these other people think? I need to live for Jesus, for his opinion. He gives a clear pathway forward to experiencing life, goodness, and grace. And if I could just see your eyes as we close this out, I just want to encourage you to go for it. Go for it. Live your life to the fullest. Here's the pathway. It starts with the right understanding of the gospel. And then you live for God's glory and people's good as you grow in him. That's how you go for it. But don't do it alone. You've got to gather with God's people, group with God's people, and go with God's people. But go for it. Live life to the fullest. Prove me wrong. Show me that a life lived that way doesn't bring peace, goodness, fullness. It'll bring struggle, for sure. But oftentimes the reason there's no friction with the world is because there's no motion happening. There's no growing. Don't let that be said of you. You don't have to be a sardine today. That's if someone says, what did I learn in church? I don't have to be a sardine. That's what you learned.